can hear the voices of the hungry hearts crying out for love. One touch when you're this hungry, when you're this thirsty, one touch changes your life forever. The love has conquered every fear, broke down each wall. There are so many notches in that key to break through. I've made duplicates of the key, and I will give them to anyone who will take one. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? Such as I have, give I thee the key to break through. I'm going to focus in on this. I'm going to fast for this. I'm going to pray for this. I'm going to worship for this. I'm going to be in the house of God every night for this. I'm going to press in. I'm going to hunger. I'm going to thirst. I'm going to get desperate. I'm going to get in every line. I'm going to put my feet on the blue line for this one day. More of you. Less of me until it's all of you and none of me. Hello, my friend. I trust that you enjoyed part one of some of the greatest financial miracles this ministry has ever seen. Well, I couldn't just stop with part one. As I continued to remember some of the other greats, we decided to do a part two. And so on this video, you're going to hear me telling stories different times, different places, a lot of them taking place at Pastor Rodney Howard Brown's camp meetings as I related these great financial miracles, great victories when, when it seemed most difficult. And so you're going to hear several more on this one, and you do not want to miss one of them. So enjoy as you watch some of the greatest miracles and believe that what he's done for me, he will do for you in Jesus name. Amen. It was actually what I caught in those meetings about provision as the poorest woman in the auditorium. Poorest woman in the auditorium. But I'll tell you what, that night, as I saw preachers maybe dropping in a hundred bucks on one side of me or, or whatever, and I was embarrassed to plunk two quarters in that bucket. But I have a feeling they're a hundred bucks, or, or maybe if they gave 500, I have a feeling it wasn't a hundred percent of what they had, and mine was a hundred percent of what I had. But I knew I didn't want to stay there with 50 cents and believe them for enough gas to get home. I knew I had a call suddenly to go all over the world and that nothing was ever going to hold me back again. I knew that God wanted to take me to places that no man or no woman can go without the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. And it was that revelation. You may not understand the tie-in, but only somebody who's experienced it. And I'm trying to give you tonight, such as I have, give I thee. It was that revelation that has carried me through even other tough things. It's that revelation even when I left my body, even when the doctor said you're going to die. In fact, after, after eight days and they sent me home from the hospital, they said, all right, you've had your miracle, but you'll never preach again. Looks like somebody was wrong. You will be hooked up to oxygen the rest of your life. It looks like somebody was wrong. You'll never fly in an airplane again. It looks like somebody was wrong. But it was the revelation that broke me free out of poverty and self-pity and not believing I could do anything that also brought the revelation in a greater way of healing to my life. The revelation that nothing can keep me down because I'm a Holy Ghost beach ball. You know what a beach ball is no matter how hard you try to hold it under the water it's gonna you better keep your your pressure on big time because it's full of air and if you let off a little bit it's gonna come up and smack you in the face and I had a revelation that no matter how hard the enemy tries to hold you down and drown you when the greater one lives on the inside of you when you are full of the Holy Ghost and fire the enemy better watch out because if he moves a finger you're gonna hit him in the face on the way up and you're gonna come up every time stronger than before but it was the revelation on giving 
that has enabled us to go all over the world and take the gospel. Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the fact that Jesus saves, Jesus heals, Jesus baptizes with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus gives us joy unspeakable. Jesus heals up the broken heart. Jesus came to deliver. Jesus makes a way where there is no way. He is the miracle worker. He is the water parter. He is the one who does everything that is impossible. So if we deny one part of it, we are operating out of an antichrist spirit. And if I deny the very thing that is made away for me, then I am denying the power of God that set me free that night. It took me out of that impossible situation and has launched me all over the world. But the poorest person in the auditorium, the one with the least hope, the one that had nothing going for, the one that everybody said it's all over for, decided there is enough anointing and enough power here. And enough word here to change my life forever and we've been able to give those keys to everyone else who will listen but oh just sitting there and getting desperate and getting hungry and getting thirsty caused the anointing to bypass over hundreds of people in that auditorium and find me right where I was sitting and launch me to the nations of the world it is caught it is not taught it is caught it is not taught it is caught it is not taught it is caught you got to catch it and as desperate as I was with those two mites, you might say, plunk, plunk, and I saw people sit around me and look at me like, bless her heart. <laughs> she comes in a total car and now she plunk, plunks. <laughs> and I just had to shake it off and go, I'll plunk, plunk my way to the nations with everything within me and it wasn't long until people were coming into our office in alaska and saying how do you do this we've been in alaska a lot longer than you and it's too expensive to get started as an evangelist we've been trying it now for 30 years and we haven't been able to go <laughs> and well, you're going all over the state and all over the country how are you doing this and i would say honestly i wasn't trying to be humble i was just trying to be honest i don't know much just getting started I'll give away the little bit I know. And they took out their briefcases. It's coming now. Those 17 ways to the 47 methods and the formula of how to go all over Alaska. And I got out my checkbook. Did we not, Katie? I got out my checkbook and said, here, I believe in you and get going. No, I came to have you show me how to do this. I just did. That's all I know. I, I probably got a lot to learn, but this is all I know. Giving my way out of poverty. Oh, there, 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 must be, there must be something a little bit more to it than that. Well, stay hungry and thirsty. Well, there must be a little bit more to it than that. Get in every line you can get in and continue to get hooked up with the anointing that changed your life and never forget where you came. Well, there must be something more to it than that. We came for the formula. We came... And, and, and many of them went back to, to having nothing, doing nothing. Those pastors that shook their heads at him, they're doing diddly squat nothing. They were doing nothing then, but you can't stay the same in God once you're presented with the truth. So if you're doing nothing and you don't want to catch it, you're going to start doing diddly squat nothing. It goes the other way. But some of us who had nothing said, I believe, I believe in this anointing. I believe that everything that God has done for them, he can do for me. I believe. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. And the anointing upon this ministry set me free from poverty and launched me into 42 nations of the world where we have now bought other people cars. I was driving a total car, and you heard earlier this week, the condition it was in, three doors bashed in, the grill, the roof. Didn't have enough to go down the street. And today, we have not only gone into the nations of the world and built churches and, and put 25 people through this Bible school. And the day that I had my new home built in Tampa, I remember my parents came to visit me and my father was unsaved. It was my grandparents that were old time Pentecostal and took my brother and I to church every time the doors were open. But my father had never, never allowed us to, to sow the word into his life. And when he walked into my new home in Tampa, he walked and started going, in my bedroom, I said, what are you doing? 
He said, I'm counting off the feet of your bedroom. It's bigger than my house is. And it wasn't a large house, but you understand they lived in a 900 square foot house in, in Nebraska. And he said, I remember when I called you and said, forget this stupid missionary idea. You've got three boys and, and we're too poor to help you. And I said, oh God, uh, dad, you'll never have to help me. I have a big God. I have a big God. And the day came before he died, I was able to buy my parents a new car. He had never had a new one in his life. And he said, you were the only one of the kids without a mate with three kids to raise alone. And he said, and, and as he began to weep, I began to tell him how good my God had been to me, led him to the Lord and was there when he died. And, and as he came out of the coma and pointed to the corner of the room and set up and just lit up, it was the goodness of God that led him to the Lord. But the Lord put a car in my hands that had been a dream since I was a little girl. I didn't ask for it. I didn't go after it. It's just like Pastor Rodney said, you're running all over the world preaching the gospel, giving, worshiping, and the blessings of God run you down and smack you in the back of the head. You aren't even turned around going, come to me. You're just going after God with all your heart. And it's another one. And you're going, what was that? Just another awesome blessing overtaking you, running faster than you're running. And it was such an incredible miracle. And uh, I had had it just weeks because when you're traveling the world, literally I ran at the same pace for about 15 years, two meetings a day, three in the foreign field, only off on Saturday. If you want to call, fly into another country on that day off. But um, so I hadn't driven it very much and I came home and I was in a meeting much like this one. <laughs> and Pastor Rodney was preaching out of First Chronicles 29. I've heard him preach out of it many times. I've preached that text myself. I knew that pretty soon the verse would be coming that, that David, God had David's heart. And David was willing to give God anything. And, and I knew what was coming up, and I still remember Pastor Rodney saying at the end, does God have your everything? And I remember thinking, you know, that may be hard for some people to answer, but yeah, I know he has my everything. And I had just given extra sacrificially that week until, quite frankly, there was nothing left, personally or ministerially. And so I thought, I can answer this easily. Does God have your everything? Oh, yeah. And when I said, oh, yeah, in my heart, I felt the tears begin to run down my face. And I heard God say, do I? And I was so shocked that he would even ask me that. I'm like, Lord, you know you have my heart. You know you have my everything. And then pastor said, I'm going to ask one more time. Does he have your everything? God, you know you do. And I heard on the inside, would you give me your brand new car? And I was so shocked again, even though, again, if you knew the whole story, I'd been given a miraculous $10,000 down payment for it, got an outstanding deal anyway, but I still was going to be making payments for a few years. And uh, I said, Lord, you want my car? I didn't even ask you for this car. I didn't even ask you for it, and it's my only one. I don't have two cars. I don't have this one as a fun, extra, luxury one and another one to drive when I come home. But, Lord, you want my car, I'll give you my car. But instead of running up with the keys that night, I thought, I don't want to react out of emotion. i got to know that I know that I know that I've heard from heaven. So I got the song, The Alabaster Box, and I had that thing detailed. It was shining like the showroom floor. And I just drove around playing it. You weren't there the night he touched me. You weren't there the night he wrapped his loving arms around me. And you don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster box. And after four days of just going, God, if I've heard from heaven, I knew what I wanted to do. And so I made plans for somebody to follow me out to pastor's house. <laughs> so I'd have a ride home. And wouldn't you know it, I wanted to surprise them and they had company. So I just had to wait, just had to wait till their company left. And I had put a painting, a Kincaid painting, which was my secret favorite thing in my house in the trunk. And um, I got that out and said, I want to bless you with this for your new home. And 
but really that whole thing was just supposed to be a distraction for what I really wanted to do. And I said, and then I've got something else, and I held up the keys, and I still remember him saying. Tell him what it was. Tell him okay, what it yeah. Was. It was a red convertible Corvette yeah. with black leather interior, the yeah. power top, the whole ball of wax. Mm -hmm. And um, had a 1,000 miles on it was all. And, uh, and, uh, and I held up the keys, and this is, this is what I want you to get. And they said, no, we can't take your car. And I still remember pastor saying, oh, please catch this. I still remember him saying, Debbie, we got more cars than we can drive. I don't have room for it in my garage. And I said, that's not the point. I know you don't need the car. Are you kidding me? I know you don't need the car. Oh, but you've got to understand, pastor. I need to give it. I'm asking God, no, we don't buy favor, and no, we don't buy the anointing. Of course we know that. But I knew there were things I was believing for that unless some stuff was burnt out again, and unless, unless I could go to another level, every time I've broken open an alabaster box, I felt part of my heart just being twisted and pulled up and twisted and pulled up. And he said, no, we can't take your car. It's your only car. How will you get around? I don't know. I'm not even hardly ever home. He said, neither are we. We won't even be driving. I know that. That's not the point. And I'm just desperate now. I'm starting to weep now. And he said, all right, we'll take your car under one condition. All right, name it, anything, fine. <laughs> he said, we don't have room for it in our garage. I know somebody else I'd like to let drive it. And I'm going, oh, okay. I'm thinking, do I know them? Maybe I can get a ride someday. <laughs> and then he said, she's a wonderful woman of God. And I'm like, she? She? No, 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 no. And he said, you agreed to this. He said, it's our car. Well, I'll take it for a ride now and then. But I just wanted to stay in your garage because we don't have room for it. And I remember, this is what I really want to get to. On the way home, I'm crying. You can believe this or not, but I'm crying because I'm so disappointed. I'm crying, God, all I've been doing is a week of consecrating this thing to you, a week <laughs> of driving around and, and playing this song, and now I'm driving the car back home. And I'll never forget what I heard. Oh, you broke open your alabaster box. Heaven saw it. Hell saw it. I saw it. Your pastor saw it. You broke open another alabaster box. And you know, as we've had such incredible miracles around the world, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of a pastor in a little country church that walked up to me and said, uh, Debbie, before you, I mean a little country church. They're living in a little country farmhouse with needs for them and their children. And he walked up and he said, he's crying and he says, my wife didn't even know I have this. I've been saving for a long time for a building fund. But God told me to break open my alabaster box all over you tonight. $52,000. And when people hear those things, they just say, Ma'am, why are some just singled out? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, upon which person should I fall? <laughs> why are these people? No. No, 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 no. As pastor so often says, there are no blue-eyed favorites in God's kingdom. But there are people who say broken and poured out. Broken and poured out. And even where I've missed him, even since then, I still believe, as pastor said the other day, there is something that gets God's attention, especially when you already are repenting and you get things under the blood. There's something that gets his attention about somebody who says broken and poured out again. Lord, I will live. I will live for you all the days of my life. Many years ago in Alaska, I was holding revival in Fairbanks. We were having 500 people a night, which by Alaskan standards is huge. Great revival, great revival, two meetings a day. And I was actually doing that revival with another evangelist, a guy who had been touched in my meetings up in Alaska. And we were kind of, he would do a morning, I'd do a night, and then I'd do a morning, he'd do a night. And he got up one night, or one morning service, no, it was a night service, and um, 
I'm sitting in the front row, and he's just chatting with the crowd, you know, trying to get him to settle down before church starts and just chatting, saying n nothing of any importance. He said, you know what? Today's my anniversary. And he said, I left my beautiful wife and my three boys at home. They just couldn't travel on this trip, and I also have three boys, so that kind of struck a note. He said, I have a wonderful wife. She's beautiful. She supports me in the ministry, and uh, I'll send her some flowers. I kept my little preacher face on <laughs> while inside my heart was breaking. And I said, Lord, wouldn't that be something to have somebody after, after what I've been through and 18 years of abuse and being beaten and, and uh, cheated on? And wouldn't that be something to have somebody who gave you flowers? Will I ever have that someday? Wouldn't that be something to have somebody who actually bragged on you in public? But nobody knew that thought was there. Nobody. I'm smiling. And the next morning, it's my turn for a service. People are on the floor. The service is over. I'm standing against the wall. And a lady's coming up the center aisle with this big bouquet of roses. And I'm thinking, what is this lady doing? She better not be trying to give so many flowers on the floor. You know, we got to always watch and pray. What's she doing? And so she keeps coming, keeps coming. And so I go to meet her right here. She said, do you remember me? No, ma'am. I was healed in your meetings a year ago, and she tells me what part of Alaska. And then I remembered she had a broken back in three places. Couldn't even walk, totally healed by the power of God. And the doctor even called it a miracle, and they took extra. She's telling me about it. And she says, I wanted to come back and say thank you again. Well, that, thank you. I appreciate that. But there's another reason I'm standing here. See these flowers? Yes, ma'am. God heard what you were thinking last night. And I was so, I was so shocked. And the Lord said to tell you, and she poured out of a plastic bag. Normally, I would think this was flaky, but she poured some rose petals on the ground, and she just went like this. And she said, he said, to obtain the sweet-smelling fragrance out of you, the petals had to be crushed first. We're not talking about poverty. We're not talking about sickness and disease. We're not, we're talking about a surrender of the heart. We're talking, and she said, and don't forget to read the card. As she walked away and I pulled the card out, it says, I love you dearly. I'm so proud of you. And I see all that you do. Your father. And in that moment, I realized that a God who knows if you need flowers a god that knows you might even need a little card you think we're ever going to lack for anything I have you and I remember the abuse. I remember the trailer. I remember living in with other people. I remember the total car. I remember the call without any means to go anywhere, even down the street. In fact, what I said to pastors that night that I held the keys, I said, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? This is no big deal. I said, these are Corvette keys, but all they are is symbolic of saying thank you for the key to breakthrough that has taken me all over the world and caused me to see other marriages put back together where people were going to get divorced rolling into each other's arms and seeing disease flee at the name of Jesus and see poverty depart over people and their children and to see the miracles and to see people running to the light and stripped out of the devil's hands, out of the kingdom of darkness and given eternal life, being baptized in the Holy Ghost and receiving, are you kidding me? This key I'm giving you, I'm so ashamed it's only a Corvette key. <laughs> I was. I'm ashamed that for now, that's got to do. <laughs> I've got goals in my heart. I've had them for a long time. I come closer all the time. I'm not there yet, but I come closer of someday I'm going to say thank you more properly. But meanwhile, I said this key, this key is just symbolic of the key that was placed in my heart and hand that has given me access to anything in the kingdom 
because you poured out of my life. And since I can't really give God a Corvette key, and we can't really hand him in his hand $10,000 or $20,000 or $1,000 or $500, he says, the way you come back and say thank you is that you put it in the hands of ministries that have imparted into your life and given you a key to breakthrough. And when you do, Debbie, you're not, they're just the, the symbolic part of it. But, oh, Debbie, I'm watching. Oh, whoever you are, I'm watching tonight. I'm watching, and I'm taking your heart and turning and twisting and pulling up, turning and twisting and pulling up. That, my friend, can't be given somebody in five minutes how to get from A to Z. That is done on the altar of sacrifice. That is done in moments like this when we're getting ready. They're getting ready to break for this new, this new headquarters, the auditorium, the headquarters for all of our ministries around the face of the earth to receive greater glory and greater impartation. And nights like tonight, we get an opportunity to come back and say, I'm, break, I'm not giving an offering tonight, Lord. No, there's times for, for a normal offering. But tonight... Tonight, I remember I was set free. To I just knew that I was hungry for God, but I came here and I got the key to breakthrough. Dad, you weren't there the night he touched me. You weren't there in Alaska in November of 1992 when he put his loving arms around me. And you don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster box, broken and poured out. Broken and poured out was these moments, these life-changing moments that you hear about somebody later. You hear about somebody later. Oh, it was that moment. That moment my heart was broken and twisted and poured out. There was a time when, when Pastor Rodney was in Africa, and um, I was privileged that night to have the Tuesday evening service back here at the river. And I, I heard about how God moved on his heart uh, to give $100,000 over there in Africa. And I knew what need they had back here at that time and how impossible that was to do it at that time. But our captain said, in a time like this, in our greatest need, well, let's give, 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 sacrificially. So back here... Pastor Rodney said, receive an offering for yourself. My ministry really needed it at that time. And I believe it was about $14,000 and how we needed that for what we were getting ready to do in the crusades we were doing. But the captain was over in Africa and he was given uh, sacrificially what, what they didn't even have to give. So I said, if he's doing it in Africa, that's what I do here and give this one back in here. And as I did, God moved mountains out of my way and we had miracle after miracle after miracle. I'm thinking of a time that we had a camp meeting. And of course, those camp meetings are almost always a week long. And it was, it was one of those weeks where, where God just moved on me to even give more than usual for where I was at that time. And at the end of the week, I went, my goodness, there's nothing left, but I'm going into revival next week, and I'm just going to believe God for a miracle. And Pastor Rodney said, I just feel like we're supposed to go on. Remember, that was the captain. That wasn't dad at the table. That was the captain. That was the admiral. And he said, I just feel we're to go on. Would you stay another week, Debbie? And I didn't say, oh, my goodness, I don't know how I'm going to do that. I said, of course I will, and cancel my next revival. And uh, the Lord gave me some, what I would call, I mean, they were miracles, so I don't even, I'm hesitant to even use this adjective, but they were somewhat small miracles in comparison to some other things. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm just getting by, but I thought, okay, at the end of the week, I'm going into revival, and I'm just going to believe God for a miracle. And Pastor Rodney said, I believe we're supposed to stay another week and continue this camp meeting. Would you stay? Sure, no problem. And, uh, and through all of that time, I continue to give. 
through all that time, uh, there were times after the ministry account was done and my account was done, there were times I just did it on my credit cards. And when I say that, I'm always, I'm always careful to say, I'm not telling people to give in your credit cards. You've got to be led by the Holy Ghost, especially if something like that. But I have a right to say when I was led by the Holy Ghost, this is what happened with me because I heard from heaven. And so I continued to do that, and I thought, no problem. God's going to give me a miracle next week. The next week, the captain said, I think we're supposed to just go on and revival right here. Would you stay? Yeah, sure. So now we're canceling four weeks of revival, then five weeks of revival, then six weeks of revival. And... Uh, Pretty soon we're in a place where now I'm having some incredible things happen. Uh, in fact, Pastor himself, I remember we went to lunch one time and just dropped a laptop computer over, over my head and, and said, I just feel to bless you with this. And there was one night that somebody said, there's something waiting in a back room for you. And I went to the back room and it was a, a full length mink coat and, um, and, and the people weren't even there. I still don't know to this day where it came from and, and. And normally I've got short arms even for my short stature normally something's gonna hit right down here but that that just was like it was tailor-made for me and then God told me to turn around and sew that and, and so I did but there were things that continued like that but I thought next week next week we'll have a breakthrough well as this went on week after week after week after week we were down to the last week and somebody on, on my staff came to me and said they said, uh, um, we've got a problem. We've got payroll on Friday. And payroll for me at that time, uh, for, for staff and me, was $5,000. And um, they said, we don't have any of it, Debbie. What are we going to do? And this is, this is uh, Wednesday. And I'm like, we're just going to continue to sow and we're going to continue to believe God because, because the leader said, let's stay and have revival in the house. By the way, before I go any further, I looked up this morning and I found at least three places. I was thinking it was one, but there's at least three places that the apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. That's a bold statement, not just follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. The reason we have the fire tonight, the reason we have the move of the Holy Ghost tonight, and that we aren't sitting in the middle of some dead religious institution having some normal little American conference is because somebody said, I will get up out of my country and I will become a missionary to the United States of America and we will have wall-to-wall -wall Holy Ghost and fire. So now getting back to that last week, here it is Wednesday, and it's looking bleak for me. <laughs> and uh, on Wednesday night, Wednesday night, another a person on my staff said, oh, Debbie, I bet you forgot, because we all forgot that we started a savings account for you uh, several months ago so you can take a vacation one of these days. We got $3,000 in it. Do you want us to pull that out? And I said, oh, yes, pull that out. Pay the staff. I'll wait for mine. But I, I still need another $2,000. But pull that out, and at least we got that. I just knew we'd get a miracle Thursday. I just knew we'd get a miracle Thursday night. We didn't. I just knew we'd have a miracle Friday. We didn't. And then, uh, and then Friday night. <laughs> No, let me back up. I, I had to, I, I used to tell this, it's been so long, I had to get the details just right. I'll back up to Thursday night. So Pastor Rodney asked me to teach before the offering, and a young man from the river came running up to me, and he said, um, he said, Debbie, I was in your meeting in another state years ago, and God asked me to give $1,400, and I never, I have no idea why $1,400, but he said, I never did it. And he said, but tonight as you were preaching, God, God told me I had another opportunity. He said, I've given in, in this offering, but I'm supposed to give to you. And he says, and God told me to double it because I missed it the first time. And he said, I've got a check here for 3000 Now, that was exactly what I needed. And, um, and I took it, and I said, oh, I've got a story for you, but I don't have time to tell you how obedient you were. I took two steps. I will never forget it. Two steps rejoicing. I got my miracle and I heard the Holy Ghost say, not so fast. 
And I thought, not so fast. Fast? Week after week after week, I've been canceling meetings and continuing to give and be obedient. Not so fast. I've been believing for my, my miracle, and I sold again tonight, and I got it, and not so fast. And then I heard him say, I want to take you up another level again. And he said, there are two other evangelists here that have also canceled their meetings to stay in this camp meeting. I want you to walk over to that one and give him $1,000. And I got really uh, excited actually because I knew that was a man of God that that believed God like I did walked on the water and and have faith and I went all right Lord and then he pointed somebody else out I'm not going to go into very many details except to say I went say what I said Lord that person doesn't blah 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 you know how we do and he said you leave that person to me and he said, I want you to be obedient. So I walked up to that person and said, God just told me to give you $1,000. He began to weep. He said, my wife stayed home tonight. We have a new baby. And she was so mad and so bitter because we can't even make our, our mortgage payment. And she said, I'm not even going tonight. He said, our mortgage payment is $1,000. And he called her, and I could hear her crying on the phone. And the, everybody's rejoicing, and I'm rejoicing with them. And, and then... And then I remembered, I still had, I still had a big need, and Friday's coming real fast. And uh, so Friday comes, and we're down to Friday night, and Pastor said, would you share? And <laughs> part of me wanted to go. If you knew where I was at, you probably wouldn't have me share, but sure. <laughs> and uh, as, I'm, as, as I'm teaching, faith is flooding me. It's flooding the crowd, and the Lord told me to give again on my credit cards again, and I'm like, oh, Friday has come and gone, and I don't even have my miracle, but all right, here we go. And while I'm, while I'm preaching, a woman starts, she sounds like a siren, she starts running around the building, and I looked and I thought, oh my goodness, I recognize this woman. I, she was in my meetings in Alaska, and she had been a drug addict and a homeless person, and I've never seen her since those meetings where she got so radically saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and changed. I didn't even know she was down for the camp meeting, and she's running around the building, and as she does, she puts an envelope in my hand. It's bulging, and she keeps running. And I'm standing there. I mean, I'm still teaching. And there's cameras. You're trying to think, what's the proper, proper ministerial etiquette for this? Uh, uh, do I open it? Do, I can see green sticking out through the... And I'm like, oh, I don't care. I've been waiting for a miracle. And, uh, and it was $5,000 in $100 bills. Not only that... But she kept running, and she dropped another one of those envelopes in one of the other evangelist's hands that I had put, that I had given to, because I had sent him up to Alaska after I was finished, and he said the same amount was in his. And I found out a lot more of it than that was in, in, in the offering here as it should be. And here's what she told us later. She said, I have a friend who's in the stock market, and, and he just got really blessed and shared it with me. And she said, God told me to do this on Monday, but I didn't get around to it till tonight. And, um, and so when the camp meeting was over, I go to, uh, I go to my revival, and, um, and it was a great meeting, and, and we were blessed in every way. People were saved and healed and filled with the Holy Ghost and delivered and joy and and the offering was, was fine, and everything was great. And the last night, speaking of how interesting that Pastor Rodney mentioned this earlier tonight, the last night when everything was all over and I was just watching, as I love to do, the Holy Spirit finish what he started. And I'm watching people on the floor. And, and a, a man with long white hair and a long white beard comes out of nowhere. I never saw him. I never saw him in the meeting. And a very elderly man. And he walks over and he says, this is for you and it's not for your ministry. It's for you personally. And God said to tell you, you'll know what it's about. He walked away. And before I opened it, I ran and got the pastor and said, where did that man go? And he said, I don't know. I don't know where he went. And I've never seen him before. And I, I didn't see where he went as he left. I opened it up. Now $3,000 in cash 
in hundred dollar bills and the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and he said, he said, when you needed $5,000 desperately, he said, and you pulled the other, it was two I pulled out of the, the savings and you still needed three. He said, somebody gave it to you, but I wanted to see if, if you would still obey it when, when I spoke to you. And so as you received the three, I asked you if you would turn around and give that. I not only brought the 5,000 for your ministry back to you, but I brought this back to you personally. Because if I have a heart that can be trusted to obey me and to come on and walk on the water with me, I will never withhold anything from you. That same camp meeting, a lady is back in the restroom before the service, and I'm, I'm just combing my hair, and I'm getting ready to go out. And she grabbed me, and she said, ma'am, you don't know who I am. But I, I've started, we've just started coming to church here. And she said, what you've been teaching every night has blessed me so much. And she said, I've just got to tell you a little story. She said, my husband and I are so poor and I, I have a little girl. We have nothing. We have nothing. But she said, we have a call to the mission field in Japan. And I've so got a hold of this teaching that today when I was at the laundromat, she said, um, she said there was a very pregnant lady there crying, and I asked her what was wrong. And she said, I'm about to give birth, and I'm sleeping on a cement floor. And she said, as she said that, I said, no, we'll give you our bed. She said, I knew I at least had that to give and to sow. And she said, when I got home and told my husband, he was furious. And he said, you gave our bed away? Yes, I'm not pregnant, and at least uh, we aren't sleeping on a cement floor. At least we have carpet. And she said, but I want you to know I got a hold of these principles because what the, what the general gets or the admiral gets and the people under him get and the people under them get, it just continues and continues until the war is won. And she said this, she said, I so got a hold of this and I just wanted to say thank you. And I said, well, good, I'm glad. And I went to step out of the restroom and I turned around I've never done this before. That's another thing we don't, we don't allow around here and we don't generally do any sort of bathroom prophecy. But this, I was arrested by the Holy Ghost. And I turned around and I said, yes, you got a hold of it. And I tell you soon and very soon, no sooner than you think, you will see God manifest your harvest. And then I just walked out of the restroom, never thought another thing about it. We go out in the service. That night was the night that I taught on the alabaster box. And as people were weeping all over the auditorium and starting to just bring things and pile them on the platform, my eyes were closed and we were just worshiping. And I remember hearing pastor say, the glory is here. Just lift your hands. And my eyes are closed. And then I hear him say, lady, lady. And, and so naturally your eyes open to see who's going to get blessed and touched. And I see him pointing at that lady. She was, she was towards the back. And now that catches my attention. He doesn't ask her name. He doesn't say, do you have a need? Uh, she doesn't say, oh, I want you to know what I did today. Nothing like that. He just says, lady, filled. And when she hit the floor, this whole auditorium that had just already been giving sacrificially began to run and throw finances on that lady without anybody knowing a thing, not a single thing. And they begin to bury her in finances and take off jewelry and bring purses and put them on her and, and scarves and go back to the book table and get books and tapes and CDs and just bury her in that. And then all of a sudden I see a man come running up, fall down beside or his shoulders are heaving and he's weeping and he's going, God, forgive me. And it, you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out he was the husband who was mad that she sewed their bed that day. And as he's doing that, people start doing the same thing and burying him in finances and giving it to him watches and neckties and going and getting more CDs. And, um, 
And, oh, I have forgotten a part. She also told me in the restroom, she said, we are so poor, but we're getting a hold of the fire here. But our family thinks we're coming to a church that is a cult. And so they told us today, if we would stop coming to these meetings, they would give us $500 because they knew our great need. And she says, I told them, keep your money. What I am getting here is worth so much more than your stinking money. But nobody knew any of that. So I'm standing there with my mouth open, watching all of this. And the next thing you know, I hear Pastor Rodney tell the ushers, gather it up and tell me how much it is. And if, if I recollect co correctly, I'm pretty sure it was $4,500 plus clothing and jewelry. But meanwhile, a visiting pastor had, had come in that night and said, hey, folks, God just told me to tell you that I'm to give you my brand new pickup truck and threw the keys on the couple that didn't want to, uh, the man who didn't want to sew his bed that very day. And I'm watching this and thinking of the word soon and very soon, quicker than you think. We were in this church in Arkansas and uh, when the pastor wrote me and asked me to come, I just assumed, I knew I had never seen him here, but I just assumed he's been at something where he knows of Pastor Rodney's ministry, knows of ours, knows what we do. No wonder pastor says he always brings people in and sits them in the front row because you shouldn't always assume that. And by that time, I knew enough to start writing people a letter to make sure they understood how we operated. So I write in this letter, we take care of all of our own expenses. You don't, have to, you don't have to guarantee us anything. We'll pay our own hotel. We will pay our own airfare. We will do everything. We'll take care of our own food. We'll do everything. We just ask that you allow us to teach on the principles of giving that has set us free. And we have him sign it and send it back. And he did so. So imagine my surprise when Sunday morning I'm teaching for their tithe and offering, not for anything that's coming to me, and I can feel the tension in the air. I wasn't used to that. I've seen people start running and dancing when I teach on the tithe and fall out drunk in the Holy Ghost, and some come run. But I wasn't used to just feeling somebody resistant like that. Then I thought, well, it'll be better Sunday night. I can feel the tension even more. I'm like, where am I? I mean, it was a pretty, it was about, I don't know, 150 people, Assembly of God Church, and and, um, and so Monday the pastor says, can we go to lunch? I mean, that's usually a good thing, but sometimes you can hear in the tone, oh, I, don't, I think this is like going to the principal's office. But sure, we, we can go to lunch. And he says, I didn't know you were going to do this all the time. I said, Pastor, I sent you a letter. Did you not? You signed it and said, oh, yeah, I, I thought maybe you were going to do it once. I did not understand you were going to do it every service. And I thought, dum da dum dum, the axe is about to fall. I guess now you learn you got to do more details. I will do this Sunday morning. I will do this Sunday night. I will do this Monday morning. I will do this Monday night. I will do this Tuesday morning. I've learned you got to put everything in the letter. And so he said, I didn't think you were going to do this every service. Okay. And, he, and then he began to cry. And he said, I have never heard anything like it in all my life. And neither has my church. But he said, as you were speaking last night, the Lord told me. He had been to Pensacola. He had been in a degree of revival there. But he said, the Lord told me, this is what I have sent her to you for. And you better not block what I want to do in this church. And he said, lady, my people don't understand it yet. And this is foreign to us. But you give it everything you got. Now I was like a racehorse at the gate. And going, okay, now that I got that, okay. That night you felt that thing break. The next day it broke more. The next day it broke more. The next day it broke more. We got to Friday night and I'm teaching on the alabaster box, but this time I only can do maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. And what happens? But the people start weeping all over the place and they start running to the platform and they start piling up. But I don't mean, I don't mean just ordinary little things. People were disappearing out the back door and they were going home and getting instruments and putting them on the platform. And then I, the whole worship team laid down there. I found out one young man had been saving for two years for a new guitar and had just gotten it. And he comes and lays that on the platform. They lay the keyboard on the platform. And then the pastor gets up and walks out. And I thought, oh no, he's really upset. Where is he going? He comes back in 20 minutes later carrying a new set of golf clubs. Come to find out he was a professional golfer, taught golf, had 
had a custom made set just for him. And when his church saw that, they all burst out crying and they all left and, and went out and got things and brought them back. And as they did, I hear a, a, a woman shout to another woman, God just told me to give you my car, not to us, but to another woman that didn't have a car in the congregation. And when she did, a young man said, well, sister, God just told me to give you my car. And this started going on with cars in the congregation, none of them coming to me. But this giving went on for hours. And then they all answered the altar call. Now, when I left, that's not even the good part yet. When I left, the pastor called me on Monday. He said, I never call an evangelist after they leave, but I just got to tell you. He said, I came in Sunday, Sunday morning, and he said, I'm the first one to get here and unlock the door. I'm the last one to lock up, so I still can't figure this out. But when I came in Sunday morning, he said there was a note in my pulpit saying, go to this store and get any, any set of golf clubs you want. They're already paid for. And he said, you remember the young man that laid his guitar down? Yes, sir. He said somebody else had a new and better guitar waiting for him when he got to church Sunday. And he said, do you remember? There was a young man who laid binoculars on the altar. And he said, you can't imagine this. He said somewhere in the middle of a service, a lady came running in and said, I go to another church. I know this is crazy. But I was going down the street and God told me to get a set of binoculars. No, not those on sale. Get those right there. And bring them to this church. And he would show me the young man that I'm supposed to give him to and it's that one right there it was the young man who had laid his binoculars on the altar but that's still not the good part the pastor said we have prayed for five men in this church that won't darken the door not even at Christmas time their wives come by themselves all five of them were here this morning and he said they all gave their lives to the Lord and he said he said at the altar call I, I, he said, I was so overcome. I just had to ask, why did you come today? We've been praying for you for years. What caused you to come today? He said, the first man said, my wife came home Friday night and told me that she gave away her car. And he said, I knew what that car meant to her. She has believed for that for years and just got it. And when she said, God told me to give away my car to somebody else, he said, I knew if, if, if there was a God who could work on my wife like that, I needed to be serving him. And he said, Sister Debbie, as we went down the line, all five of those guys had a similar testimony. It was the breakout of the anointing of love and giving and sacrifice and that oil running down people like oil and honey that caused those men to come running to the altar but he said Sunday night I came in and he said I just felt led to say church we've never had the money to do anything to take revival anywhere but oh I can believe God for anything now let's go out and break ground tonight for a new new youth center and he said we dug the hole for the youth center and they began to bring people into revival from all over I'm telling you that church, those people, those five men that got saved, we would never even know about that throughout all of eternity. In fact, they would have spent eternity in hell had somebody not said, I know one thing, I'm going to live to give all the days of my life because my father is a giver and I'm going to be just like him. And as that spirit impacted my life, all I knew was that's all I want to do all the days of my life is live to give. And every time our ministry has been up against it, which is quite often where the devil's breathing down your throat saying you're not going to make it another week and you can't give like that. If you only had a clue even this week, so I'm just not going to go into the details. But God says just give, 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 give. And I've been there so many times. And not one time, not one time, I don't care if it's week two, week three, week four, week five, week six, week seven, week eight, week nine. I've done it when I said there's no way we can do it again. And I'm telling you, they've always been our greatest miracles. They've always been these kinds of stories. They've always been incredible favor. You know, when we went to Madison Square Garden, I just went to support what Pastor Rodney was doing there. 
took a week off our revival, but God had laid it on my heart to take up offerings wherever I went before that to give them to Good News New York. And we were able to give $50,000 into that crusade. And I remember as I heard the soul count going, I wish we would have had 100000 to give into it. I wish we would have 500000 I wish we would have had a million to give into it. But we just went then to be a part of watching the celebration. And Pastor had mentioned to me, he said, call so-and-so in New York. And if you're coming to New York, Debbie, tell them that I've said <laughs> that I've said that they should get you some meetings. And, and so I made one phone call, and they said, oh, Debbie, I'm sorry. We don't have time for that. We don't even have time to put on what we got to for Good News New York, let alone get evangelist meetings. And again, Pastor Katie was with me, and, and they said, well, should we talk to Pastor Rodney? I said, there's no way we're going to talk to him. Oh, listen to this closely, because God just brought this back to my heart. If, he, if you'll get this, you'll see something. I said, are you kidding me? He is putting on the biggest soul-winning crusade of his life so far. He's believing God for millions of dollars. And every, am I going to call him and say, you said you get me some meetings, and, I, and, and your person said they don't have time to get me meetings. Can, can you do something about that? I said, are you kidding me? We're not going to ask another person. I don't need any meetings. We're just going to go and bless, bless, give, give, and celebrate. And as we got there, I'll never forget the night that he said, I think at like 725, I want you to come up and teach at 730. Okay. <laughs> but as we did, as we did, People came running up and saying, you know, can you preach in my church and my life was forever changed and blah, 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 blah. However, I knew of other people that were just coming to sing, please get this, and do other things in the crusade. And they were mad if their hotel room wasn't a certain way. They were mad if they didn't have this, mad if they didn't have that. Mad. I thought, have you people even been around this ministry? Have you even caught and pick and been around this ministry? We can sleep on a floor. We can sleep with bug infested whatever. I've done it many times in many nations. It's not about that. It's about the impartation of the Holy Ghost. It is all about the offering. It's your fire for a